All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, my name's Rich Conroy. I'm the Education Director at Bike New York. I'm also certified by the League of American Bicyclists as a one of their cycling instructors or smart cycling instructors. And I coach for the League of American Bicyclists um, to train league cycling instructors. Um, I have, I don't know how many years of experience riding a bike. I started riding a bike on streets and roads when I was in middle school. So let's say, um, about 40 years ago, and I just never stopped doing it and I've always enjoyed riding. Um, probably my first time in New York City, it felt like a little bit of a rush to ride in Manhattan traffic, but uh, it wasn't that much different from riding anywhere else, I felt at the time, which was back in the early 1990s. A little bit about Bike New York. We are a nonprofit organization based in New York City, whose mission is to uh, promote cycling as a uh, source of fun, safe, economic, environmentally sensible transportation and recreation for everyone. Uh, we are supported by our main events, the Fiber Bike Tour and some smaller rides that we do, um, all of which got canceled this year. Um, so it's kind of been a tough year, uh, both financially and programmatically. Those events support our free bicycle education programs, which in a normal year reach between 24 and 30,000 New Yorkers, kids and adults alike of all ages and backgrounds uh, with free classes, free programs like after school programs, summer programs, programs during the school day. Uh, and these are largely programs that uh, where people come to our bike ed centers or New York City parks and have a chance to practice riding bikes, practice and improve their skills. Um, we haven't reached that many people this year, but we've really tried. During COVID, we created a whole series of videos that are largely covered by this class and you will get uh, the link to the videos uh, in a follow-up email. Um, the videos might actually be more helpful than this class for you. Um, and we created a virtual bike education resource hub for teachers and parents. Uh, mostly with curriculum resources for kids, um, including books, curriculum activities, uh, even a, uh, STEM resources around um, bicycle related uh, topics. All right, let's move on. So tonight's topic is uh, rules of the road or what we call street skills. It's about how to ride on the roads and streets safely and smoothly uh, with minimizing conflicts with other road users, uh, sort, sort of in a way that just fits in seamlessly. Um, and how do you go about doing that? You know, what I hear in among a lot of new cyclists and in the bike advocacy community is that uh, biking is scary. And a lot of our bike advocates talk about death a lot. But you can actually do a lot for yourself. And we'll, we'll get into that. But uh, so what we're going to talk about is uh, how your choices can make a difference, not only for yourself, but other people. We will cover some bike laws to make sure that you know what, what the laws are. Um, We'll talk about a, a, a concept called the layers of safety. We're gonna cover uh, surface hazards to be aware of what's going on with the surface of the street or the road um, so that you don't have a, a crash and get injured uh, just from one of those things. And then the rest of the presentation will cover kind of like where do you belong on the road? How to fit in? How to change your position on the road? 
some things you should not do, how to make sure that drivers see you and how to influence and change other people's, or specifically drivers' behavior simply through your own behavioral choices. Um, so that's kind of like what we're going to be covering this evening. So the basic idea of this presentation is that cyclists are not helpless victims uh, at the mercy of forces of traffic. That we have choices when we're behind those handlebars and that those choices make a difference, not only to our own safety, our own sense of security and confidence, but also to the safety of other people. It makes a difference in terms of making our city a better place, especially for people who are not riding a bike. Uh, I've been to a huge number of community meetings in New York City where, you know, we get lots of complaints. Whenever biking is on the agenda at these community board meetings, you just hear a lot of complaining about cyclists. You hear a lot of complaining in the media it's very easy for I'm hoping this is still on if you are seeing a sign in <laughs> screen um, hold on I'm just I'm gonna sign in I don't know why this is doing this All right, if this got interrupted, please put it in chat. By the way, I do have everybody muted because we do get some background noises that people oftentimes are not aware of. Um, we will give you the opportunity to unmute yourself um, at the end of this slide deck so that you can ask questions verbally. Um, if you do have questions as we go through the slide deck, please put them in chat and we will take a look at those questions also at the end of the slide deck. Normally during our classes, which are in person physically, we can uh, be more interactive than just running through a slide deck and dealing with questions at the end. All right, as I was saying, uh, you know, as, as cyclists, I think we want to ride in a way that makes ourselves feel safer more comfortable, more confident, but also make choices uh, that are good for other people and don't get them upset, get them to become bike haters. And the basic idea behind our safe cycling curriculum is when you are out there riding your bike, you should be thinking like a driver of a vehicle or at least a responsible driver of a vehicle. Now, oftentimes this doesn't register in New York City because half of the adult population does not own cars and does not have a driver's license and has never taken a driver's ed course. However, if you have a driver's license, have taken a driver's ed class, are a vehicle owner, a lot of what we're going to cover is going to make sense to you as a driver. And that's what you should be doing as a cyclist is behaving as a responsible, consistent, predictable user of the road. Okay, the other critical concept here is that uh, cyclists have the same rights and the same responsibilities to follow the rules of the road. They're protected by the law, but they're required to follow the law as drivers of motor vehicles. Uh, now, this picture, this image here, you know, we shouldn't take this too literally. Bikes are lighter, they're more maneuverable, uh, cyclists are more uh, vulnerable, we don't have that steel uh, shell around us. However, in ter legal terms, cyclists have rights. Uh, I sometimes have motorists say, well, you just have to be careful because you chose to ride on the road. And to a certain extent, it's true, we have to be careful, but that doesn't, just because 
we choose to ride on the road or the streets doesn't suddenly mean everybody around us is exempt from following traffic laws and rules of safe behavior. They still have to do that. Uh, it's still unacceptable to cut somebody off when they're on a bike, uh, to open a door up on them, uh, you know, to, to behave dangerously around them just because they chose to ride a bike. So what difference does it make uh, when you follow the rules of the road? Uh, for one, there's going to be fewer crashes. Cyclists will have fewer crashes when they follow basic traffic rules. And critically, that will mean stopping at red lights and stop signs. Stopping before you enter the road from a bike path, a driveway, or an alley to check for traffic. Using lights at night and going the same direction as other traffic, like not riding, facing the traffic. Every time a cyclist gets killed in a traffic crash, it makes the news, and that creates a lot of fear among people who say they would like to try it out, but they don't also want to get killed. About half of all fatal and injurious traffic crashes to cyclists are caused by cyclists failing to observe some critical traffic rule. When there's less fear about cycling, more people ride bikes and that in itself makes cycling safer. This has been studied uh, repeatedly and shown to be the case that when there are more cyclists out there on the streets and roads, the crash rates actually go down, not up. And the other thing is we don't want uh, to go to those community meetings and hear complaints about cyclists. We don't want to hear negative news stories uh, that are created by a situation where it's all too easy for somebody with a news camera to go out on a street corner and watch cyclists breaking one rule after another. When there's less negativity about cycling, there's more political support for it. And that means better budgets for things like bike shares, safety programs in schools, bike lanes, bike facilities. When we have that political support, we need to be, when we're out on the street, creating the basic groundwork for that political support. All right. That's enough of that kind of like sermonizing, uh, even though I think it's critical and on point. Let's talk about this concept called layers of safety. This is your strategy, uh, your, your way of sort of organizing how you're thinking about safety. So the first layer of safety is basically just controlling your bike. 50% um, of bike crashes that send people to the emergency room do not involve another motor vehicle. They tend to be people falling off their bikes, running into other cyclists or pedestrians or animals, or losing it on some sort of a surface hazard. So we're gonna spend some time dealing with those kind of like non-motor vehicle crashes, especially surface hazards. It's critical though to be alert and to not distract yourself. So to that end, um, not using headphones, uh, not paying attention to your phone. In New York City, New York City is a crowded, congested place and there's a lot going on on the street. A street that can seem clear and free one second, the next second there's a pedestrian right in front of you who walked out from behind some big visual uh, obstruction like a van parked next to the curb. Um, even when you were not on the street, not on the road, you're on a bike path or a separated bike lane, you still have to be alert and use the traffic skills that we're gonna talk about in the rest of this presentation. The second layer of safety is, as you're riding, not being the cause of crashes. Now, in our first layer of safety, some things like surface hazards 
can be a cause of, of crashes, which is a physical condition, or maybe not having great handling skills. Uh, but the second layer of safety is following traffic rules so as to not be the cause of those 50% of collisions that do happen with motor vehicles. Um, so that means some obvious rules of the road are stopping at stoplights and stop signs. And in New York City and most of the rest of the United States, cyclists are only allowed to proceed when the light turns green at a stoplight. Now in New York City, it's a little bit different. You are allowed to proceed when the walk signal gives a little white pedestrian signal, uh, even though the traffic signal may be red still. Uh, but that's, that's after the crossing traffic has already stopped. Another critical one is stopping and checking for traffic whenever you are crossing or entering a road from a bike path, a bike lane, um, well, not a bike lane, bike lanes on a street, but a bike path that's off street, an alley or a driveway. That is the law. Cyclists have to stop check for traffic, yield to any traffic that's approaching, and then go when the coast is clear. Another critical one is riding in the same direction as traffic, not against. We'll go uh, through why that's the case. The only time you're allowed in New York City to ride against the flow of traffic is if there is a bike lane that is marked counterflow against the flow of traffic and you will not find very many miles of bike lane in New York City that are marked that way. There is some often for very short distances or sometimes there's two-way bike lanes along the side of a street but for the most part those bike lanes go in the same direction as traffic. When you are riding at night please use a white front light and a red tail light that's working and visible from at least 300 feet. That is the law. I keep using the expression 50% because the statistics on these crashes are divided up in different ways. 50% of fatal bike crashes happen at night. And that's disproportionate because the vast majority of bike riding happens during hours of daylight. And it is often the case, I mean, there are other factors involved, but I have seen a lot of cyclists not riding with lights at night and also not realizing they're literally invisible and at the mercy of somebody else's reflexes and vision and alertness. And then finally, in New York City, please don't ride on the sidewalk if you're over the age of 13. Uh, it's against the law. The sidewalk is not a safer place to ride. It is separated from traffic, but it's not a safer place to ride. There are pedestrians there. They're often unpredictable. They're not expecting a heavy, fast-moving object. Um, and it's often when you leave the sidewalk and enter the street is the danger point for riding a bike on the sidewalk. third layer of safety is riding in such a way that prevents other people from making mistakes. And this is a little more subtle than just following the law. It's riding in a way uh, that communicates with other drivers, whether it's using hand signals, that's another state law, or um, a little more subtle, like riding in a way that visually signals to somebody, signifies to somebody that you are occupying a space and there is not enough space for them to share that space with you. And so it's, it's a behavior changing way of writing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get to some of the other slides. We are not going to cover hazard avoidance in this uh, presentation because that's more of a physical on bike activity uh, that's really for advanced cyclists. Uh, but I think if you 
follow the first three layers of safety closely, you should very rarely have to deal with a traffic emergency or traffic hazard. And then finally, um, injury prevention. And this is what you need when everything else goes wrong. The first layer is safe, first four layers of safety, you've been trying to follow those. And then all of a sudden, you, there's a crash that's going to happen. And the idea here is you need to minimize your injuries. So we stress uh, three techniques or three devices for that. One is certainly a helmet, which is the most important uh, to protect your brain from a long-term or permanent brain injury. Second thing you want to do when you're riding is wear padded gloves. Um, Padded on the palm, I can buy biking gloves or batting gloves, baseball batting gloves. Uh, if you do have a crash and you put your hands down to brace yourself against the fall, uh, padded gloves will prevent some very painful uh, injuries to your palms. And then thirdly, it's a good idea, especially if you're riding on faster, higher speed roads like highways to wear some sort of protective eyewear. Uh, particularly trucks can kick up little bits of uh, gravel into the air and um, you want to protect your eyes from you know flying projectiles and, and they also help with stuff like uh, pollen dust things like that getting into your eyes all right let's talk about surface hazards. I'm going to say in my long biking career, most of my crashes, nearly all of them, have invol involved some sort of a slick or damaged surface. So we're going to talk about that. So the first one is potholes. And what you want to do, that's, that's where you need to be alert and paying attention not only to what's going on around you, but what's going on with the surface of the street. Uh, this is where you don't want to be looking at your phone. And uh, the other thing you don't want to be doing when you're riding on the street is following another vehicle pretty closely because you never know what's going to come out from underneath that vehicle, including a major pothole that can cause you to lose control or even worse, go over the handlebars. Um, so the simplest way, if you can see these potholes coming up, is to simply uh, control your position on the road, take the lane. Uh, sometimes if you see it coming up, you might have to change your position and then you'll need to like scan behind you, signal that you're moving, you're changing your position on the road to avoid this problem. Be aware, please, that uh, puddles can hide potholes. So if you are riding in the rain, it's a good idea to either avoid puddles or before you get to them, slow down so that you have time to see and react what's inside that puddle. If the puddle is clear, like it's clear water, you can usually see potholes that are inside of it. But if it's kind of like muddy, salty, slushy, dirty water, uh, I would steer around that. I would not go through that because you can't see what's inside the puddle. Another big hazard are sewer grates. So New York City has all sorts of infrastructure that sits on top of the street. We have big vents and doors for electrical in infrastructure that's under the, under the street. We have uh, what are called manhole covers that are about two and a half feet wide. And sometimes those things are sunk into the street a good inch or so that will give you a pretty good jolt. You want to avoid, you know, those, those manhole covers that are sunk into the street. But the big one is sewer grates with parallel grooves like this. Now you don't see sewer grates made like this in New York City, although I did kind of see one the other day. Most of New York City sewer grates uh, have a finer uh, series of crossbars that go across them. The, the danger here is if you are um, riding a skinny tire road racing bike, 
something that's between 18 millimeters to 25 millimeters wide, 28 millimeters wide. Those skinny tires can go right into this and bring you and your bike to a sudden stop, except that you keep going and you go over the handlebars. And you also note this sewer grade is a good three to four inches sunk into the pavement. So uh, if you run into that, you are going to have a, a pretty bad crash. Um, now, how do you avoid this? Well, one is you could just kind of like be alert and watch out for them, but really you should not be riding this close to the curb anyway. Uh, that's where all the you know, loose gravel, broken glass, sticks, wet leaves, all the stuff you don't want to be riding in congregates. Uh, it's also a place where, as we will see, you are less visible to other drivers and pedestrians possibly. Now in New York City, we have mostly curbside parking. So riding into a sewer grate or riding right next to the curb is not really a big problem, but, uh, or something that you have much of a chance to do. Uh, however, if you have a bike lane that's right next to the curb and that bike lane is separated from the rest of traffic by parked cars, like New York City separated bike lanes, you don't want to ride this close to the curb. There's just too much stuff going on there. So the, the moral of the story is ride further out, three, four feet away from the curb, please. Now you might not see this in New York City, although I ride across the Broadway Bridge that separates Manhattan from the Bronx on many, many days, and it does have expansion joints that look like this. Uh, now this picture is from one of our rides, I think, and it's showing everybody getting off of their bikes and walking across the expansion joint, which you can do, but in this picture, some marshal or police officer is telling the bicyclist they have to get off and walk. Uh, most of the time, you're not going to have anybody forcing you or telling you you have to do that. Uh, you can get off and walk. You can pull off to the side or the edge and walk your bike over this. Uh, but the best way to do it, if you want to keep moving, is to uh, cross these at a diagonal. Um, that way your front wheel won't get caught in them. And that may mean you have to change your position on the road, which means scanning behind you, signaling, checking for traffic, and then maneuvering your bike um, at a diagonal across these expansion joints. But they have the same effect as the, the gutters, the sewer drains, is the big gap here can catch a skinny tire, a skinny wheel, and your bike just gets caught in that and you go over the handlebars. Railroad tracks um, can be like the expansion joints on a bridge. They can catch your front wheel, but instead of like going over the handlebars, either the rail itself or the groove next to the rail can catch your front wheel, even with bikes that have thicker tires, and can steer your bike for you rather than you controlling it and steer you out of control. So the idea here is to cross any railroad track at a 90 degree angle, at a right angle. Some railroad tracks cross roads at a perpendicular or 90 degree angle, but many of them do not. And so what you have to do is, again, as you see this coming up and you, there's going to be all sorts of warning signs for railroad tracks, is scan behind you, signal that you're moving over. When the coast is clear, uh, if nobody's coming up or about to pass you, cross those tracks at a 90 degree angle and then move back to the right side of the road. Um, it would kind of be opposite if the railroad tracks were in this angle here. Um, you probably have to take a direction where you move to the center to cross the tracks and then move back. Okay, so we're going to cover a variety of slick situations. Um, 
with a slick surface, and we'll talk about different types, your reaction kind of has to be the same. If it's unavoidable, like a big steel plate like this, or a big patch of ice that goes clear across the bike path, relax, don't slam on the brakes, don't do any steering, just coast your way through it. Um, that's the best way to handle it. Uh, if you get your bike on a slick surface and that's when you decide to have a panic attack and do some radical steering or some hard braking, your bike is going to lose it and skid out from under you. So usually when I see one coming up, I just stop pedaling because the pedaling motion can also uh, cause some minor imbalancing of the bike, which on ice can be a major thing. So uh, some surface hazards to be aware of that can cause you to lose traction, to skid out, to have the bike slip out from under you, certainly wet leaves. Uh, one of my crashes was I was making a turn at an intersection and uh, there was a pedestrian crossing in the crosswalk and I didn't see her till the last minute. And so I had to turn more sharply and that was a moment where my bike was going over a patch of wet leaves. And as I turned sharper and banked more sharply, my bike just slipped out from under me. Uh, so again, with wet leaves, straight line riding, no braking, because wet leaves are slick. Now, um, if you have like a, a snowy day or a sleet storm or a nice storm, that may be a day where you don't ride your bike. Uh, there are studded tires or mountain bike tires can help you get more traction with snow. Um, but, but typically if you get a little bit of snow or a little bit of ice and it's patchy, or say for example, the bike path that you use, uh, they plow it and it gets cleared of snow. What ends up happening is you get little patches of ice. Um, that snow may melt during a warmer day and then freeze. It melts and then it covers your route with patches of water that then freeze at night. And that's where you can get some slick sections on what is otherwise or seems like an otherwise clear bike path that doesn't have any snow on it. Um, and so if you do see patches of ice, uh, those you know, those are going to handle like any other wet, slick surface. And that is just relax, coast your way through it. Uh, one thing to be aware of is uh, frosts or freezes, particularly in the winter time. If you have kind of a humid night with a freeze, uh, that can cause, uh, that frost can cover like a bike path in particular with a layer of frost that's very hard to see. And if there's any curves or tight turns, all of a sudden, uh, what seemed like a, a pretty rideable surface is now very slick. Something that you wouldn't get on the street because uh, the automobile traffic, whether it's the warm vapors coming off of cars or the movement of air, tends to clear those light frosts off in a way that they don't get cleared off on a, a bike path. One other type of surface hazard that doesn't involve a slick surface is uh, any kind of like parallel edge or parallel groove or parallel crack. In other words, it's parallel to your line of travel. So with this, you might have a parallel edge right along the edge of the, uh, the steel plate that New York City uses for temporary street repairs and construction projects. Um, oftentimes on a street, a multi-lane street, when the pavement starts to wear out, it's the seam where the machine laid down the pavement tends to get a nice deep crack like this. And then any driveway, you have to watch out for driveways where you're leaving the road or the street and you're entering some sort of a driveway. Um, 
oftentimes there is a lip on that driveway that can be as thick as one inch. So uh, if you have to cross some sort of an edge like this, you want to do it at a 90 degree angle or close to it. You don't want to approach it at kind of a, a tight angle where that lip or edge or a groove like this can take down your front wheel. I'm going to tell you, I was uh, first time I had a fat bike and you know, the fat bikes, they have wheels that are like the tires are four inches wide. I got a little too bold with it. And there was this little section. The first time I rode it, this little section in the park that had a little curb. And um, that curb was maybe an inch, inch and a half tall from the surface around it. It was like, my fat bike will go right up over that. Well, it didn't. That curb just took the front tire right out and I crashed on my first ride with a fat bike. So, you know, do, do be aware. And I've had a couple of other crashes in my life that involved uh, uh, driveways, um, things like that. I've also had a crash that involves loose gravel resting on pavement. So, you know, road drains can often collect loose gravel. Uh, with loose gravel, you want to sort of treat it like a, a wet surface, a slick surface. No hard braking, no really tight turns. Your, your bike will be able to turn on loose gravel, but if you're doing a really sharp bank turn, your tires are probably going to lose traction. So you have to kind of take it easy with the turning or braking while you're turning so that you don't lose traction. Now, these types of crashes, at the worst, they're probably going to uh, maybe cause some broken bones. I've never had a broken bone. They'll probably just cause painful road rash. You still don't want that. It's painful. And it might bang up your bike a little bit. So we still want to avoid those kinds of things. We don't want to be taking a trip to the emergency room. Uh, or having to do, you know, first aid on some painful road rash. And we don't want to take our bike to the bike shop to get damage repaired. Finally, be aware of just like other people, other users. Um, with runners, you never know what they're going to do. And sometimes runners have a little habit of suddenly doing a U-turn an abrupt U-turn without checking to see what's coming up behind them. You want to be aware of other animals. In a rural area, this could be deer, bear, moose. Uh, I was riding on a bike path in Maryland once, and luckily I was paying attention because a small group of deer, like four or five deer, just crossed the path right in front of me. Uh, people who are walking dogs on leashes, you just kind of have to be aware, slow down, alert the dog owner that, or dog walker that you're approaching so that they can pull their, their dog in. Always give people lots and lots of room and space on these bike paths and bike trails. If you are on maybe a rural trail, uh, mountain biking trail with horseback riders, please alert the horseback rider vocally that you are approaching um, just so that you don't spook the horse and cause them to be bucked off. And then finally, be aware um, of little kids. Little kids act very much in the moment. Uh, they can come running out of nowhere. And so you have to be prepared to stop. If you see a group of people, maybe just slow down so that if something sudden happens with a little kid coming into your path, you're in a lot better position to, to stop quickly. Um, if you were on a multi-use trail and there are little kids riding their bikes, that's not a good time to ride in a racing pace line and use some sort of bike speak like passing on your left or on your left. Uh, you have to slow down, take it easy. Uh, I had a friend who was badly injured in a bike crash when she was leading a fast paced group ride on a trail like this. And she was coming up behind some kid and she said on your left and the kid thought he was being told to move left and he just swerved right into her path. Um, 
So on your left was a good idea, but not at that speed and not with the kid. All right, let's talk a little bit about rules of the road and traffic safety. Just as a reminder, cyclists are required to follow all the same rules of the road that motorists are required. There are a few exceptions to this, like the Idaho stop in Idaho, uh, but we are not in Idaho. One of the first rules is when you are entering the road, from a bike path, driveway, sidewalk, alley, you have to stop, scan for traffic, yield to any traffic that is approaching, and then go when the coast is clear. Don't just kind of ride out into the street or road without stopping to check. Uh, minor roads also, you want to be careful when you are crossing intersections, especially busier roads. Those will usually have a traffic control device like a stop sign or a traffic signal. But if they don't, it's always a good idea to slow down, be alert, check for approaching traffic as you enter that intersection and cross that road. Um, okay, so uh, this is probably a better slide for intersections, uh, but please do be aware that um, if you are going straight at an intersection and both the oncoming traffic and you have a green light or there's no uh, traffic control device at all, no stop sign, no traffic signal, straight through traffic has the right of way. So in this situation, the motorist is supposed to stop and wait for the cyclist to uh, clear the intersection. Now, what you see in New York City is not necessarily the case. So be aware that this person may not see you. Uh, that's about riding visibly. They may not know the rules of the road. They may feel like they got to go before the light turns red, so they'll cut you off. Or they may get waved through by another driver who's next to you on a multi-lane street. Um, I usually handle this by making eye contact with the driver. I keep my pedals turning, but I'm still, I'm like preparing to stop in case this person does some sort of wild west maneuver and cuts me off. Um, that's sort of how you handle uncertainty about whether or not this person sees you, whether or not they know the rules of the road. Be prepared to stop, keep those hands on the brake levers, make eye contact. But I, was, I like to be assertive. Uh, I keep the pedals turning to signal to that driver that I'm going through, even though in my mind I know that I may have to stop if they cut me off. So uh, another topic for yielding is when you need to change lanes, you should one, like, and you need to change lanes a lot in New York City because there's always people who are double parked, people who are parked in the bike lanes. Um, that, that's usually why you have to change lanes in New York. Sometimes you might have to change lanes to get into a turn only lane so you can prepare for a turn. But when you are changing lanes, scan over your shoulder first. This is a right side of the road situation. If you're on the left side of a one-way road, which you can be, you would maybe want to scan this way if you need to move to the right. You scan first, check to see what's back there. You give a hand signal that you need to change positions. If somebody's there and they're about to pass, they have the right of way. They're already in that position in that lane, and you're the one who needs to move where they're at. So they have the right of way. People who need to occupy and move into that space have to wait and yield. The other thing you want to do when you need to change lanes is give yourself plenty of time and space. If you see that double parked car two blocks ahead of you, that's the time when you need to start doing the scanning, doing the signal. 
don't just come up right behind this car and then kind of do a last second wild maneuver to go around it. That is the kind of like unpredictable thing that drivers don't like and it also causes crashes if somebody else has to swerve or if they hit you. So plan ahead if you need to change lanes. So where do we belong on the road? Um, if it's a two-way road, the general rule, there's a couple of different rules here. One is uh, what's called speed positioning. So slower traffic is on the right, faster traffic passes on the left. That's something you can even use on a bike path like the Hudson River Greenway. You pass slower moving cyclists or slower moving pedestrians on their left, usually, unless they're like walking in the middle of the bike path and you have to figure it out. If there is a shoulder or a bike lane at the edge of the road or the street that is not occupied by debris, uh, by parked vehicles, you have to be on that shoulder or in that bike lane if it's safe and usable to use. Now, in New York City, we use a lot of one-way streets, um, and especially one-way multi-lane avenues in Manhattan. Now, a lot of those avenues have bike lanes on the left side, and you're generally required to use those bike lanes. However, if there is no bike lane, you can be either on the left or the right side of a one-way multi-lane street as long as you are going in the same direction as traffic. Like this. And a lot of cyclists would argue you're actually safer being on the left side of the street because you're less likely to be um, doored by the passenger side door of parked cars and you're less likely to have conflicts with buses which are always stopping on the right side to pick up passengers and let off passengers. Uh, and you'll notice on our multi-lane streets and avenues, most of the bike lanes on those are on the left side, not the right side. So again, we're still on the topic of where do I belong on the road, um, especially when there is no bike lane. The law is, in New York City and New York State, if there is a usable bike lane, and that word usable is critical, you are required to use that bike lane. That does not mean you do not belong on the street when there is no bike lane. You have a right to use that street when there is no bike lane there. Um, don't let any driver say, get in the bike lane when there's no bike lane there. You belong there. Uh, now, usable bike lane, if there are people walking in it, like near Times Square, uh, near Port Authority, if there are cars parked in it, if there's debris, if there's snow, uncleared snow, you don't have to use the bike lane. There's nothing in New York City or New York State law that requires you to put yourself in danger or ride over obstacles in order to stay in the bike lane. Now, when there is no bike lane, you want to make sure that you are at least four feet away from parked vehicles. And you want passing vehicles to give you at least four feet as well. So that now adds up to about eight feet. And you yourself, depending on you and your bike's girth and width, probably take up about two feet. That comes to 10 feet of space that you need, that you have a right to for your own safety. Now, most New York City traffic lanes are only about 10 or 11 feet wide. Uh, very few of them are this wide. New York State law gives cyclists the right to do what's called taking the lane or controlling the lane when that lane is too narrow to share side by side with a passing motorist. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, of mo bit more about taking the lane. We'll show you a couple of pictures uh, in terms of when to do it and why. 
Uh, I can think of a lane up here in the Bronx near me. It's on Broadway. It goes right past Van Cortlandt Park. And it's a really wide lane for about three blocks. And so I sort of feel like I can safely move over. Um, it is actually this wide. And then further north past the end of the one train, that extra wide lane becomes a separated bike lane. But most traffic lanes in New York City are not this wide. They're more like this wide. Let's talk a little bit about intersections. I already mentioned you have to watch out for left turning drivers at intersections uh, on a two way street or a two way road uh, who are coming towards you. So we'll talk a little bit more. We have another picture coming up. But uh, as you approach an intersection, you want to think about where you need to be, depending on where you are going. So the rule is choose, and this is not a state law, this is more of a, a conceptual rule, is that you choose the rightmost lane that leads to your intended de destination after you've gone through that intersection. Remember we said slower traffic on the right, faster traffic passes on the left. And in a lot of situations, cyclists are the slower traffic. So we generally belong on the right side, especially of a, a two-way road. Now this diagram shows one-way roads. Um, so normally if I'm going straight at an intersection, I'd wanna be in the right-hand lane that goes straight. If there is a right turn only lane though, one that has a single arrow that shows that you can turn right only from that lane, you don't wanna ride in that lane because it indicates to motors coming up from behind that you're gonna turn. Well, you wanna be in that lane if you are turning right, but if you're going straight, don't stay in a right, only, right turn only lane because a motorist may come up, pass you, and then cut you off uh, thinking that you were going to turn right. So where you position yourself indicates to other people coming up from behind and maybe people coming from the other direction where you're going to go. But the other thing you don't want to do is cause a conflict <coughs> with somebody who's going in a different direction for you, from you, that is. So in this situation, this cyclist wants to turn left. And both lanes are striped to go straight. But theoretically, you can turn left here because the crossing street is in a direction that goes left. The problem with this cyclist position, their lane choice as they come to the intersection, wanting to turn left, is that they're setting up a conflict with somebody else who might be or probably is going straight. And if that person is faster, the cyclist makes that left turn right across their path. So the idea here is you don't want to be crossing paths with other people at intersections, and you don't want them crossing your path, which is why you anticipate what you need to do. You get in the lane that you need to be in, and you choose that lane according to where you're going to be when you get on the other side of that intersection. And you choose it so that you don't cross paths with somebody else and they don't cross paths with you. So this cyclist who's going straight is doing it right. She's staying in the rightmost lane uh, that goes straight and faster traffic can pass her in that lane. This cyclist who wants to turn left is also doing it right. He or she has moved over into the left lane. That means uh, there's no possibility for somebody to pass him or her causing a collision right here. And if he or she has to wait at the intersection for maybe opposing traffic to, to clear, other traffic can go around them in this lane right here. Um, so be aware of where you're positioning yourself at intersections so that you don't cross paths with other people, they don't cross paths with you, 
and your position sort of indicates to other people where you're going. All right, so we've talked a little bit about riding in the same direction of traffic. Actually, we've talked a lot about it. Cyclists often ride against the flow of traffic for a couple of different reasons. One is they think it's safe. Uh, I can see what's coming, they can see me, I know what's coming, so I'll be safe because I can avoid it. Those cyclists don't like being in this position because they don't have eyes in the back of their head and they can't necessarily see what's coming up from behind. The other reason people ride against the flow of traffic, in New York City at least, is we have a system of one-way streets which makes it not entirely convenient all the time to follow the one-ways legally. Sometimes there might be three one-way streets, side streets, going in the same direction. I never understand why New York City does that, but it sometimes happens. Sometimes you have a super block, um, say a huge public housing project, like the Frederick Douglass houses, which go on for blocks and blocks and blocks with no passageway through them. Um, and so some people are like, ah, I don't want to go like a whole mile out of my way to follow the one ways. All right, but here's what happens. The wrong way cyclist is not so likely to get hit by this person, maybe at night, maybe if they're not using lights, they're actually likely to get hit by this person, the person entering the road or crossing the road at an intersection or a driveway person making a turn out of a driveway or making a turn at an intersection. Drivers, when they're entering a road or crossing a road, tend to look in certain zones where traffic is supposed to be coming from and where danger is likely to be coming from. So this driver here wants to make a right turn and he's going to look here or any traffic that's coming. That's a likely source of danger. If he was crossing the road or making a left turn, they would also look over here just to make sure there's not a cement mixer bar barreling along that's going to hit them. They're not going to look here because there's not supposed to be anything coming. And this is where the wrong way cyclist really makes themselves invisible and totally unpredictable to this driver. They didn't expect it to be coming. They didn't see it coming. The same applies to riding wrong way on the sidewalk or on a bike lane on a street. Is drivers entering the road, crossing the street, turning at a street, aren't going to see it coming. They just don't look there. They might see a pedestrian, which is much more, you know, more slow moving traffic, but not something that's, that's fast moving like a bike. You're just much safer riding in the same direction of traffic, but people coming up behind you have much more time to react to your presence on the road. So the closing time is much longer. And the people uh, entering the road and crossing the road have uh, a much, much higher chance of seeing you and reacting to your presence appropriately. So this applies to bike lanes, certainly don't ride the wrong way. As I said, there are a couple of bike lanes, a few bike lanes in the city, Prospect Park West, uh, in Brooklyn, Kent Avenue in Brooklyn, Vernon Boulevard in Queens. But you'll notice all of those bike lanes are right next to something like the East River or Prospect Park, where there's no chance of, of traffic really crossing their path. And so you'll see like a separated bike lane with two-way traffic in those situations. But this is like an Upper East Side street where there's intersections. Uh, this is a long block here. And so you don't want to be riding the wrong way, even in a bike lane. It's just not cool. So
So I've mentioned taking the lane and taking the lane does a number of things for you um, as a cyclist. Uh, one, if there's uh, debris, uh, gutters, sewer drains, um, you want to be able to maneuver. If there's potholes in the middle of the road, you want to be able to maneuver. The state law does allow cyclists to take or control the lane. That means riding in the center of the traffic lane. When that lane is too narrow to share side by side with a passing vehicle. One reason why you're going to have to take the lane is to stay out of the door zone. Many of our on street bike lanes that are not separated from traffic are actually striped in the door zone and an opening car door can take up half of that bike lane, maybe even two thirds of it. If there is no bike lane, you want to be riding four feet away, which is probably going to put you in or near the center of a narrow traffic lane. Now let's keep in mind, if somebody opens up a car door on you and you collide with it, they are at fault. Both New York City and New York State law is very clear about that. It is the driver or the vehicle owner or the passenger's liability if they open up a door into somebody else's right of way. If that somebody else is a cement mixer and it takes off the door, too bad. The vehicle owner, driver, passenger is liable for that damage and not the trucking company. If you as a cyclist get injured because somebody opened up a door on you, the, the motorist is liable for your injuries and damage to your bike, just so you know. But you don't want to get injured. This is a good way to have some severe injuries or even get killed, and that is dooring. The way to avoid it is to ride four feet away from any parked vehicle at all times. I cannot emphasize this enough. I ride on New York City streets a lot. I've had a lot of close calls with dooring where I'm cruising along and all of a sudden a door opens up randomly. You're never going to be able to see it or predict it. The only reason I've never had a collision with a door is I ride this far out. Uh, if I rode closer, I would have been doored I could say three, four, or five times by now. Okay, let's talk about taking the lane. So this is a nice uh, sort of quiet two two way residential street in the Bronx with parking on either side. This is a typical New York City traffic lane. Now look how much space is there. Uh, I was stationary when I took this photo. I was standing right next to, or pretty close to the parked cars. And you can see even this motorist that passed me, they're driving on the center line just to give stationary me a little bit of space. What if I was riding along? Is this enough space between this vehicle and these parked vehicles? The answer is no. Uh, there's barely enough space for this person to avoid an opening car door, um, probably. And so what do I want to do? I want to ride in the center of the lane. What that does is it signals to this person that there is not enough space in that lane to pass me side by side, that they either have to go over the center line, waiting until oncoming traffic clears, or they have to wait behind me and wait for on tra oncoming traffic to clear. Uh, very rarely do I get a motorist who is hostile to this idea. Most motorists understand the, there's not enough space here for them and me to be in the lane at the same time. And they wait patiently and then pass safely. 
most motorists get that and they're pretty patient with it. What you don't want is to be riding over here and get somebody who's a risk taker or impatient because riding over here signals to them, hey, I can kind of squeeze through here. There, there might be enough space. You don't want them making that calculation. You want the calculation to be extremely clear. And that is by riding in the center of a lane, which signals to them that there's not enough space. I mentioned at the beginning of this slide deck, this presentation, that the way you ride can change other people's choices. And this is a critical example of that, probably the critical example. Writing over here gives this person one set of very dangerous choices. Writing over here gives this person a totally different set of choices that are much safer. It's called taking the lane, it means riding in the center of a lane that is too narrow to share side by side. By all means, if the lane is wider and there's maybe not parked cars or there's a, uh, a shoulder, it is both courteous and the law to move over so that the person can pass safely in that lane. But the law does not require you to be courteous when it puts your life in danger by somebody who might miscalculate how much space is available. Let's look at another situation. This is a different Bronx street. This is a four lane, two way road, uh, Bronx Park East. This, this vehicle's actually just parked here, which is not cool. I think double parking is kind of a dangerous thing for cyclists, but let's imagine that it's actually moving. Once again, there's not enough space for anybody to be riding their bike right here. But let's talk about where we wanna be riding behind a larger, taller vehicle, especially as we come to an intersection. We have somebody coming the opposite direction. What would happen if I was riding right here or maybe right here, right behind this van, the van passes through the intersection, but this person wants to turn left. Am I in a good position? Probably not, because I'm probably going to be shorter than this, this van, and I'm going to be obscured. Uh, this van acts as a visual obstruction to this person. So again, where I ride makes a difference for this person if they want to turn left, and it changes their choices. So if I'm on a street with... Um, you know, maybe I'm on behind a semi, a bus, a van, a truck. I ride further back and I ride further out, especially as we approach and go through an intersection. That way this person sees, I actually had a close call one time. I was riding behind one of these, it was an SUV, but it was pretty tall. And I was kind of riding over here and I was, I was a little ways back, but this vehicle in front of me cleared the intersection and I'm kind of right behind it. And the next thing I know, somebody's trying to turn left and almost hit me. Um, luckily they weren't going fast, things were going slow enough, but I realized that I had made myself invisible simply by where I was riding. Okay, let's talk about intersections and bike lanes, bike lanes that are separated. Now, New York City uses a lot of these bike lanes uh, in Manhattan and in other locations where they put green striped or green painted bike lane right next to the curb and the sidewalk. So you have pedestrians over here, you have a little buffer zone so that the people in the bike lane, don't get doored by a parked car. And then you have the traffic lanes. Now, every other intersection in Manhattan with these bike lanes, you're gonna have drivers wanting to turn left. Most of the time, these bike lanes are on the left side. 
And there's a couple of different ways New York City handles that so that left turning drivers don't collide with cyclists going straight through. One is the left turn arrow, a left turn green light. So the motorist will pull into a left turn lane and the bike lane has its own little traffic signal, with bike symbols. And the light will change from green to yellow to red on that bike signal, allowing these people to turn left. And oftentimes these people can continue because they still have a green light. But that means you, you know, if you see that red bike light appear, it's no longer green. You have to stop so these people can turn left. That one's pretty easy to understand. The one that's harder are what are called these mixing zones. And I think drivers don't necessarily understand them very well. So the mixing zone is this kind of starts right here where you have these dashed lines. And what happens is the, the paint ceases to be green. There's a lot of dashed lines. This is a shared lane now. And the motors can kind of move in to the bike lane in preparation for a left turn. So how do you handle this? Because I think it's kind of tricky. You might have some people moving along at pretty fast speeds on say 8th Avenue, 1st Avenue, Columbus Avenue, where these mixing zones are at. And they're cruising along and they're put their turn signal on, they start to move in here. So what I do is I start, first of all, I move over here closer to this striped buffer zone so that as the driver gets here and they're starting to move over, they can see me. The other reason why I move over is that oftentimes in these mixing zones, you'll get a line of cars waiting for pedestrians to cross in the crosswalk. And if I stay over here, all of a sudden I'm kind of like, tangled up with these line of cars. They may be stopped, but I have nowhere to go. They're kind of like bumper to bumper. And now I have to stop. Whereas if I move over and there's a little gap, I'm in a better position to pass them on this side and then get back in the bike lane on the other side of the intersection. Uh, just be aware that oftentimes drivers entering the mixing zone don't stop. They don't slow down too much unless there's a line of traffic and they don't realize that they are the ones who have to yield. Remember I said, when you're moving over, changing lanes, you have to yield to somebody who's already in that lane. Well, guess what? That's a rule that applies here. The cyclist is already in that lane and it's the motorist who's making the change who wants to occupy some space in there. The cyclist who's already there has the right of way. Now, I try to be pretty assertive, but again, this is another situation where I'm preparing to stop, I'm slowing down, I'm scanning back here over my four o'clock to see what's happening. Is somebody trying to move over? Are they trying to enter this mixing zone? I'm moving over so that um, I'm more visible to them, but I can also go around on the side where they're not turning. Um, so they're kind of tricky, but the city uses a lot of these mixing zones with these physically separated bike lanes, especially in Manhattan. Another thing you wanna be aware of at intersections, and this has killed a lot of cyclists in New York City. Um, whoa, whether you're in a bike lane or not, do not pass a vehicle at an intersection on the side where it can make a turn. If it's a two-way street or road and you overtake vehicles right as they approach or enter the intersection, they are not going to see you. There's not supposed to be something passing on the right. You remember I said slower traffic on the right, faster traffic passes on the left. So in this situation, the cyclist is kind of breaking that rule and they're trying to pass. Where it comes deadly is with trucks, buses, semis, 
box, box trucks, the driver, those things have huge visual obstructions. It's really the cyclist's job to either take the lane, and if that vehicle starts to make a turn and you're taking the lane here, now you're in a great position to pass on their non-turning side. Whereas this cyclist, if a large vehicle starts to make a turn and they're right here, they're trapped. They have nowhere to go. You're totally dependent on this person's wits and reflexes rather than being dependent on your own wisdom. We always want to be dependent on our own wisdom and not put other people in a bad situation where we're totally depending on them. Uh, same thing if this is a, if this street is a multi-lane one-way avenue or maybe just a single lane one-way street. If you're riding on the left side of that street and you're approaching an intersection where people can turn left, take the lane there. Don't be passing somebody on the left side where they can turn left into you. This is a good example of it. Um, and I, I've seen cyclists have close calls with say a, a box truck, a moving truck where they, a city biker was trying to pass and they go close to the curb just as a vehicle is entering the intersection. They're trying to pass that vehicle on its right side. And in the one situation I can remember, probably the passenger in that vehicle happened to notice and the driver slammed on his brake and saved that cyclist from himself. You just don't want to be in that situation. What if somebody doesn't see? Okay, and then finally, I mentioned uh, using lights at night. Uh, I see a lot of people not doing this. And again, this is a situation where you are putting yourself totally at the mercy of somebody's alertness, their wits, their sobriety, uh, their attention span. If you are riding at night, make sure they see you. Use a red tail light on the back, a white tail light, a white light on the front. Um, and a lot of bikes and biking gear come with retro reflective striping on pants, on shoes, on jackets. You can buy these retro reflective vests from uh, like construction suppliers, uh, safety stores. The law is though a white light in the front, a red light in the rear. There is no law requiring you to wear uh, a safety reflective vest or anything like that. Uh, unless you're a, a delivery cyclist, those delivery cyclists are required to wear safety vests. And then please do communicate with drivers. Um, my reading of New York State law says these are the hand signals. It does not necessarily say cyclists have to use them. Uh, the law really sets down which ones you're supposed to use so everybody's on the same page as that. What I have found with drivers, particularly if I'm approaching a double parked vehicle or some situation where I need to move over, when I give this signal, I get a lot more courtesy, even unnecessary courtesy, from the driver who's coming up from behind me. Odds are they'll let me in when I give that signal. I'm not surprising them. I'm not doing something unpredictable and sudden. Uh, but anyway, these are the signals. This is for turning right or moving right, changing, I'm sorry, turning left <coughs> or changing lanes to the left. This one is a right turn signal. Most people don't understand that anymore, but it was invented for car drivers before cars had electric turn signals. This is, uh, I'm slowing down, I'm stopping. It's palm backwards. I view this signal when somebody gets a little aggressive and comes up to me from behind at high speed. Palm out, palm backwards. All of a sudden they realize, hey, I'm going too fast and I'm about to hit this guy because he's slowing down. And I can visibly tell or, or I can sense that they back off when I do that. And this, this is called the right turn alternate or when you're making a right turn or changing lanes to the right, 
um, it is legal to use this signal in New York and New Jersey. And then very briefly, please do wear a helmet. The law in New York State is, and New York City, um, teens, I believe 14 and over, do not have to wear a helmet, which means in most of New York State and all of New York City, teens 14 and over and adults do not have to wear a helmet. So if you get a ticket from a police officer in New York City for not wearing a helmet, uh, go to court and get that ticket thrown out unless you are a commercial cyclist. Commercial cyclists are required to wear helmets. Other helmet rules in New York State, um, New York State parks, any of the roads in a New York State park, you are required to wear a helmet. And Rockland County, which is near New York City, it's one of the closest counties to New York City, cyclists are required to wear helmets in Rockland County. I don't know about the other counties. If you don't live in New York City, check your local law. Um, just briefly, do wear the helmet correctly. Make sure the drafts, straps are adjusted so that the helmet is covering your forehead. The side buckle is below your earlobes. The side straps form a V right around your ear. Straps should not be twisted. These buckles should not be down here. Chin straps should be buckled. It shouldn't be super tight, but it shouldn't be like hanging down either super loose. And then make sure that the front of the helmet's actually facing forward. Occasionally I've seen people riding with their helmets on backwards. And I mentioned other protective gear. We won't go over that. So that's the end of our presentation. It is just a little past 725. Uh, we've probably gone a little longer than I wanted to. I'm going to stop the screen share. I am going to give you the opportunity to unmute yourself, but I cannot do that for you. So if you want to ask a question verbally, um, you will need to unmute yourself first. All right. So let's see what we have going on in chat. So Miles asks a good question about whether your, your lights should blink, uh, should flash. And I have some very strong opinions about this. <laughs> uh, generally, I think it's okay for your backlight, the red light to flash. Um, it's the white light that I have mixed feel, the front light that I have mixed feelings about. The, the bike industry is kind of in this arms race with the power of front lights and even rear lights. When you are on a bike path like the Hudson Greenway or Parks Department Greenways that are not really part of the street or road, please, please, please turn your white front light on steady mode. There is no reason to have your white front light in flashing mode on a bike path zero reason whatsoever. Some of these lights are now getting to be 1,200, 1,500, 1,700 lumens. It's like a train light coming at you or one of those lights on, a, on an airliner. And you put that on flashing mode, it's like a flash going off in the face of oncoming cyclists. Please do not do that. As somebody else, Amy R. points out, flashing lights can cause migraines and seizures, especially for people who suffer from epilepsy. People who have epilepsy can do all sorts of normal activities and you have no idea whether or not they have epilepsy or not. If you have a very low power, inexpensive light, then I, you know, I don't feel so strongly about putting that on flashing mode, but know the power of your light. If it's anything over 50 or 100 lumens and you're on a bike path, keep that thing on steady. When you enter the road, then again, I, I have more mixed feelings about it. Um, 
it depends on the power of your light. If your light's not that powerful, I, you know, I can put it on, you can put it on flashing mode. And some lights now have a steady mode that gives a very occasional little strobe, but it's not that active. Uh, again, you don't want to give some driver or an oncoming cyclist on the road an epileptic seizure because you had your thermonuclear weapon mounted on the handlebar on flashing mode rather than steady. Uh, I, I got to say I use sarcastic language here because it's so frustrating uh, to see some of the high power lights coming at me at night on the bike path. And, and also aim that light down in front of your front wheel several feet. If it's aimed like chest, neck, head high, and you have it on high or on flashing mode, you're blinding the person coming towards you on the bike path. All right, that is a big soapbox issue for me, as you can tell. Um, all right, let's move on. Okay, Amy, Idaho stop. Good question. So Idaho has a state law that says cyclists, people riding bicycles, can treat a red light as a stop sign. Which means, yes, you do actually have to stop at the red light. You can't just roll through it. It's not a yellow light. It's not a green light. It's a red light. You have to stop. You have to check for traffic. If there's no traffic coming, you can go. And then the Idaho stop also lets cyclists treat a stop sign as if it were a yield sign. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you can blow through any old stop sign. It means you have to slow down, check for traffic. If nothing is coming, you can keep rolling. If something is coming and you're treating that stop sign as a yield sign, that means you have to yield to the folks who don't have the stop sign. Um, what I will also say, probably is that there's some liability rules attached to this, that if you stop at a red light and then go and then cause a crash, you are liable for that crash. If you fail to stop at a stop sign, you fail to yield, you are probably liable for a crash because you failed to yield. So it's not a free for all. A lot of bike advocates uh, really want other states and cities to adopt the Idaho stop. Uh, I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, I personally think New York City way overuses traffic signals. They use traffic signals in places where they don't need them at all. Uh, it, you know, it, it's amazing. I'll see a new traffic signal go up. There's traffic signals on side streets that are one way going in, in just only two directions. I'm like, why is there a traffic signal here? When a stop sign would do. Uh, I, I think one way is to just like reduce <laughs> misuse and overuse of, of red lights in particular. Uh, by the way, New York City has not adopted the Idaho stop, but as I mentioned, if you were stopped at a red light, and you see the pedestrian signal on the opposite side go to the, the white walking signal. Cyclists can now legally start their way through the intersection, whether you're turning or going straight, on the white pedestrian signal. It's still a good idea to stop and you know, make sure everybody else has stopped. Uh, but you can legally go on that white pedestrian signal now. All right, we have a question here. I am in a bike lane on the left side of 6th Avenue and need to make a right turn. What is the best way to do that? What about turning into a street with a bike lane on the left as well? I'm not familiar with 20th and 20th Street. All right, let me answer the first part of that question. So there's a couple of different ways you can handle a right turn from a left side bike lane. Uh, if it's 
a separated bike lane, it's a little trickier because you have to like get across that line of parked vehicles. Um, you could do that at the mixing zone. Um, if there's nothing coming through, you can, you can like start to leave the bike lane in the middle of an intersection. I, I would be careful of that. You still have to scan over your shoulder, this time your right shoulder, because traffic is going to be on your right. You have to do a hand signal saying I'm, I'm turning right. Uh, and then it's a good idea to just scan again, check again over your right shoulder and then move over. And you need to plan ahead for this. If you know you need to turn right at 25th Street, say, um, I'm just making this up. I would start working on that maybe at 20th or 21st Street, give myself plenty of time to cross those lanes while I'm moving. It's like three lanes of traffic. The other way to do it that's completely legal is you get to the street where you need to turn right. And um, you can either cross as a pedestrian when you have the pedestrian right. So you, you get a red light. Now the pedestrian right light to your right side has a pedestrian signal and maybe the, the traffic going through that intersection also has a green light. You can become a pedestrian and walk your bike across the street. Um, or if you still have the green, you can just kind of like pull off in the in front of the traffic or next to the traffic that's waiting at the red. Um, so that that traffic would be on your on your left side, and you you know you go past the crosswalk, past the curb, you stop, you pivot your bike so it's facing right now uh, in the direction you want to go. You wait for the green and you go. It's perfectly legal. Okay, what about turning into a street with a bike lane on the left? So, I mean, you can, you can kind of do the same thing. Let's say, uh, and it, it depends on the street that you're already on. So I, I can think of one, it's um, 106th and Broadway or 110th and Broadway. No, wait, 106th and Amsterdam has a separated bike lane on the left. 106th is two way, I think uh, two lanes or maybe a center turn lane. So. I basically just get into that center turn lane for a left turn. When I get the light or the, the traffic is clear from the opposite direction, then I turn into the bike lane. But the other way you could do that is you would just, like, let's say you're on 106 and you need to turn on to Amsterdam where that bike lane is at, is you stay on the right because that's a two way street. You stop at the light, you position yourself um, so that when that light turns green for the people in Amsterdam, now you're on the left side and you can go through the intersection when the light turns green and enter the bike lane on the opposite side of the intersection. Uh, there's lots of ways to safely use intersections without having to ch change lanes. Uh, what if I need to do a left turn and I'm on the right side of a street bike lane or no bike lane. Um, I, and there's no bike lane on the street I'm turning to. What you can do is if you have the green, you're, you know, you're approaching that intersection, roll through on the right to the opposite corner of the intersection, still on the right side. You stop, you pivot your bike, you wait for the light to turn green if there is a light or if there's no light, but just traffic, you wait for the traffic to clear and then you go. Um, and that puts you on the right side of the street that you just turned on, it's perfectly legal. All right, hope that answered the question. I don't have a lot of diagrams for that. Uh, Teresa asks, can you ride in empty bus lanes? I have heard that's actually against the law, but I've never been able to actually find the citation. I have heard of cyclists getting tickets for it, 
Um, I do it all the time. I'm not sure it's the most dangerous thing. If I do see a bus that's catching up to me from behind in that bus lane, I scan over my shoulder. I do my left turn signal. I scan again and I move out of that bus lane. Typically, however, the buses are not faster than a lot of cyclists. Buses are pretty slow moving objects due to the number of passengers that are getting on and off, traffic congestion, other problems. But I don't obstruct the 40, 50, 60 people riding that bus if they are faster than me. Uh, second question from Teresa is riding on sidewalks against the against statewide or only NYC. It's only NYC. Uh, it's a local law. Please do check the local law in city or town or county where you are at. Uh, Amy's asking about rear bike lights that function as turn signals. She says they may exist, but I wonder why it isn't common. Uh, some of the older ones were kind of clunky and required you to fit, flip a switch on your handlebar. Um, that's, that's like kind of like so 1970 um, versus 1975. There's now a helmet, and I forget the helmet manufacturer that um, has lights on the back of the helmet that are built in that have turn signals, and I forget how they're activated. They might also be activated by a wireless device on the handlebar. Um, I, I think that hand signals actually work pretty well. They're very visible. Um, to motorists. Uh, if you are wearing gloves at night, look if they have any reflective gear on them, they're still very visible. Um, Amy asks about handlebar mirrors. So, you know, if you want to use a mirror, do use one. There's helmet mounted mirrors, um, there's eyeglass mounted mirrors. Um, I don't use those. I have a kind of maybe a, my own scare issue with helmet and eyeglass mounted mirrors. I'm always afraid that if I have an unplanned trip to the pavement, that thing's going to end up in my eye. I've never actually heard that happening though. Um, I did it one time way back in the 1990s, use a handlebar mirror because I rode on a street in Queens that just seemed like a racetrack. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to see people coming up from behind well ahead of the fact. Now, keep in mind, mirrors do have blind spots. They don't cover the entire road. If somebody's pretty close to you, that mirror might not pick that up. So you still have to know how to scan over your shoulder while maintaining a straight line of direction with your bike. Um, but if you feel comfortable with a mirror, um, get one. There's a good they're good uh, handlebar mounted bar end mirrors for road bikes and uh, hybrids and mountain bikes as well that even fold in. Uh, if you're using a road bike, there's one that fits right into the end of the handlebar. It's a pretty discreet little thing uh, that doesn't stick out at all. Okay, bike bells. So I should remind, uh, Teresa asks, and bike bells, how do you feel about bike bells versus saying on your left on shared path? So it is actually a New York state law. You're supposed to have a bell or a horn on your bike. And I have heard of people getting tickets. They usually get a ticket for something else. And then the police officer adds another ticket for not having a bell. Uh, I think bells are pretty useless for warning motorists. And if I'm in a real emergency situation with a motorist, I use my voice. I yell um, just to get their attention. Uh, I think a bell on a bike path is a, um, a fairly polite way to alert pedestrians. It also may be a little bit vague. Uh, and people who are wearing earphones, headphones, will probably not hear the bell. So um, I, I use both, though. I use bells, and I will also say on your left.
And I think that's what we have for um, questions from chat. Do we have any, like, now we're at 745. Do we have any verbal questions? People who want to ask a question audibly. I think that would be a no. So um, let me just say one more thing. Uh, I think sometimes the, the still diagrams we have in the slide deck aren't as helpful as they could be. We do have a series of videos that we created this spring starring our staff. And some of those videos are live action on a bike or from a bike that you can see situations and how to handle them. You can find them on our website, bike.nyc, under education. And the first item under education is Virtual Bike Education Resources Hub. You click on that page. There's a bunch of stuff for kids. And then, but near the top under Bike New York Curriculum Resources is a big list of those videos. But then you click on that, it leads you to um, our Vimeo page where we have those, it's called uh, bike education at home or something like that videos. And I think they're a lot clearer than our, uh, some of the slides in this slide deck. So anyway, I'm going to say good night and you will get a follow up email with a recording of this class, which will include the visual of the slide deck, the chat. Uh, the questions, and uh, you'll probably get a link to those videos as well. But anyway, everybody, have a good night, and uh, you know, please go out there and, and ride safely, and you know, have a good time when you're riding. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us.